Good morning, everyone. It's Resurrection Sunday morning. I'm Brian Johnston, the pastor of Gospel Light Baptist Church in Richmond Hill, Ontario. Thank you for watching our live stream on this Easter Sunday, 2020. Today, we're going to remember the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, but also celebrate because he is alive. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it declares to us the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again. This is the only way of salvation, faith in the gospel. Uh, this is our only hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is risen. In the short film that we just watched, the disciples had given up hope. Their master was dead and buried. They had seen him crucified. They'd spent three years listening to his teaching, but now their Savior was gone, and they had given up hope. But then I want you to listen to what the Bible says in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. It says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh the Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto him, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes uh, lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. Now when the disciples saw the empty tomb, they believed. Later in John chapter 20, Jesus appeared before all the disciples and spoke to them. And he brought them peace. He brought them hope. He brought them joy once again. May I say that Jesus always brings peace. He always brings joy. He always brings hope to those that will believe on him. One man, Thomas, was not there when Jesus first appeared to the disciples. And so Jesus appeared to the disciples again. Eight days later, I want you to listen to that account. In John chapter 20 and verses 24 to 28, the Bible says, And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. 
Judas wasn't there that first time. But when Judas, Judas uh, sorry, when Jesus appeared to them the second time, the Bible says this. The Bible says in verse uh, 25, the other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said this, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the prints of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither uh, thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believe. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. When Thomas saw the proof that Jesus was alive, that Jesus had truly risen from the dead, he declared, my Lord and my God. Thomas believed. Thomas was declaring his faith and his trust in Jesus Christ. Thomas believed that Jesus was God, just like Jesus had said he was. Thomas was thrusting, sorry, Thomas was, was trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. He was believing that Jesus had power over sin and power over death, power over the grave, power to forgive sins, power to save, and power to give everlasting life. You know, no man has the power to save. No man can save you, but Jesus can. Because Jesus is truly the Son of God. And he has power to forgive our sins because he's God. In John chapter 20, verses 29 to 31, it says this. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name. Jesus performed thousands of miracles in his earthly ministry. But the greatest miracle of all was his resurrection from the dead. Thomas saw the, res the, the risen Savior. He saw Jesus Christ and he believed. He believed all the words that Jesus had spoken. The Bible tells us that these things were written down for us. They were recorded in God's word for us so that we would also believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that through our believing, through our trusting, through our putting our faith and total dependence on the Son of God, we can be saved. We can know that we have eternal life. Who is Jesus Christ? Well, I know that he loved the common people. He loved the poor. He was kind and loving and compassionate to sinners. He loved the outcasts. He loved those that were rejected. He loved those that the religious Pharisees looked down on. He was a friend of sinners. Jesus certainly was no friend of organized religion. That crowd wanted him dead and gone. Who is Jesus? He's my friend. Who is Jesus? I'll tell you who he is. When Jesus came, rather, when, when, when Judas came to the Garden of Gethsemane with soldiers, Judas had already agreed to betray Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. And when Judas led those soldiers that night to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus didn't run away and hide. He came out and asked them, who are you looking for? And he willingly allowed himself to be taken prisoner that night. When Jesus was brought before Pilate for questioning, Jesus never argued his innocence. When soldiers spat on him and plucked out his beard, he never retaliated. When they wanted to nail him to a tree, he submitted himself to it. When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Jesus Christ, he loves you and me. And he willingly laid down his life for us on the cross, taking our place, dying for our sins. Who is Jesus? He's my Savior. I want you to listen to the words of this song about the beautiful hands of Jesus. sick 
Jesus' love for us that kept him on the cross. It wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was his love for you and me that kept him on the cross so that the penalty of our sins could be paid for, so that we could be set free, so that we could have eternal life. God will cleanse and God will forgive us of all of our sins if we'll turn to Christ from our sins and believe on Jesus Christ and receive him as our personal savior. The hands of Jesus are still reaching out to you and me. They are pleading for us to reach out to him and to accept his gift of love and mercy and pardon. Will you reach out to accept that gift of love and forgiveness and salvation that he offers to you? I want you to watch this video of a doctor describing what Jesus suffered and endured for you. And I want you to ask yourself, what does Jesus mean to me. Yeah, I, I believe that Christ's suffering uh, and the demonstration of the kind of, um, of physiologic stress that his human body was under uh, is manifested in the Garden of Gethsemane, where it's described that he was sweating blood. And there are there is a well-documented uh, medical condition in which patients who are under tremendous amount of uh, emotional stress and physiological stress can in fact uh, sweat blood because little blood vessels within the glands burst and, the, and then the blood is expressed. The, the, the scourge involved the use of a, a short whip with pieces of uh, typically metal, sometimes bone, sometimes pieces of porcelain wrapped in these leather straps which is then utilized to, to come across uh, typically the back, the shoulders, the legs of the victim. Uh, and uh, the first few passes across a particular body part would tear through the skin, the fat, uh, but eventually, once the outer layers were, were uh, torn away, it would start getting in the muscle and the tendon. And of course, along the way, you're ripping through all the blood vessels that supply all those tissues. And so you're losing blood the whole time. The plant that was described um, uh, actually had a very long thorn, um, not the little thorns that we would think from a rose bush. These were thorns that were uh, typically an inch and a half to two inches in length. The scalp is one of the most vascular portions of our body. It's got a huge blood supply up there. So then having those thorns shoved down into the, you know, down onto the bony plate would have gone through all the scalp which in and of itself would have created a huge amount of blood loss. Uh, I've seen people actually bleed to death from just a scalp injury. So uh, this is not a small injury to have, uh, who knows, dozens uh, of these things shoved into your scalp. And so that would have caused more blood loss. Typically when a victim has to uh, uh, carry the cross, what has been described uh, in the literature, in, in actual Roman literature, is they, they describe, the, they, they, they carry the crossbar. Uh, and the crossbar is estimated, alone, was estimated to weigh about 110 pounds. And of course, if your arms are stuck out here, wrapped up on the cross, crossbar, and you fall down, you need help getting up. You, you, you just can't get up on your own because there's no possible way without your arms to get up. So you would have needed help getting up. If he, fall, if he fell over, there's a good chance that he could have hit his chest, which, which then could account for the possibility of a cardiac injury. Anatomically, we consider the wrists as part of the hand. And so uh, with the placement of the nails between the radius and the ulna, at that position, it, it still fits, fits the definition of being in the hand and it's in a position in which the nail won't rip out, which you have to have, you have, to have a solid point of fixation. Uh, another interesting point about the placement of that is the median nerve goes right straight through that particular uh, 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 portion of the wrist. And so there would have been uh, either destruction of the nerve or, or impingement of the nerve that would have created a tremendous amount of pain 
so that every time you try to take a breath, you'd be, it'd be agonizing. You'd be pushing down on spiked feet, which of course hurt, and then you'd be hanging on spiked arms. And so you alternate from excruciating pain to excruciating pain every time you take a breath. So, so even if he survives the actual crucifixion, he would have had to survive what I believe to be a, a, a lethal injury from the spear to, to find out whether he was alive or not. What's described is the loss of water and blood, and that would entail either the, the uh, uh, either a pleural effusion or pericardial effusion, and the blood would have come from either pulmonary artery, a pulmonary vein, the aorta or vena cava, or the heart itself. None of those injuries, unless you're treated immediately by a trauma surgeon like myself, with all the advanced equipment that we have, would be survivable after even a few minutes. Christ says the Son of God could have survived anything. He chose to manifest himself as a human at that point in time and allowed himself to die. And, and being human at that point in time he could not have survived this particular series of traumas. It's not possible. Um, Christ as God could have survived anything they threw at him. And, but he chose to be Christ, the human, at that point in time to die for our sins. And that given that, that self-limitation of remaining to be human, he died. He did not survive the event. I, uh, I'm profoundly impacted by it because I realized you know, the price that he paid was something I'm not, I would be, never be willing to do for probably anybody. It's very difficult for me to even sing songs about the cross, even in worship. Because I truly do understand what he paid, the price that he paid. I know who Jesus is to me. He's my friend, my savior, my redeemer, the one who purchased my redemption. I was a lost and guilty sinner, separated from God and on my way to hell. But one night I confessed my sinfulness to God and I recognized my need for the savior. And in my heart and in my mind, I turned to, to Jesus Christ. I admitted to God, I agreed with God about something that he already knew about me, that I was a sinner. I remember the night when I believed and said, Lord, Lord, save me. Jesus, I, I trust you as my Savior. God, I, I ask you to forgive my sins. And you know what? God did save me. God changed me. You know, it doesn't matter how much good we do. None of us will ever be good enough to get to heaven on our own. We could add together both of our good works, you and me, and that would still not be enough to get either one of us to heaven. The truth is that at our very best, we're all still sinners. Only God is perfectly righteous and holy and just. You know, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's sort of like you and me shooting arrows at a target. We're aiming for that bullseye. We're aiming for the center of the target. But every arrow that we shoot falls short or it comes up short of that mark. We often miss the whole board entirely. And that's because we're sinners with a sin nature. You know, I've never had to teach any of my children to do wrong. I've not had to teach them how to sin. It comes naturally to them because they're so much like their mother. I mean, no, just kidding. They're, they're so much like me. Ever since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, man has been born with a sin nature. And we all sin because we choose to, but also because it's in our human sinful nature, part of our human DNA, if you will. Children can be selfish. Children can fight over toys. Children can hide themselves or try to cover things up when they do wrong. But you know what? Adults are no better. 
In fact, we're probably much worse. First, we, we must be willing to be honest with ourselves and agree with God that we're sinners. Secondly, I want you to know that in spite of your sin, God loves you. God loves you with an everlasting, unchanging love. He will never love you any more or love you any less than he does right now. That means that God in heaven, he's not up there expecting you to do, to do good works to earn your way to heaven. God is not waiting for you to do something for him to gain his love and acceptance. He already loves you. In fact, God loves you and me so much that he does everything necessary to bring us into a relationship with him. Think back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they sowed uh, leaves together to cover up their shame when they sinned and disobeyed God. But God ends up saying to them, "Uh, your own man-made coats, they just won't do. And God makes them a covering of skins to cover up their sin and their shame. When the sins of mankind were great upon the earth in the days of Noah, God sent a flood to destroy the earth, but not without also making a way of escape, a way of salvation for those that would repent and turn to God. And God provided an ark of salvation for those who believed. When God sent plagues upon Egypt, God saved his people. The final plague meant death in every home, but the Jews were saved. Why? Why was that? It's not just because they called themselves Jews or they were, you know, God's people. It was because they killed the Passover lamb and sprinkled the uh, blood of that sacrificial lamb on the top and on the sides of the doorposts of each home. As we consider the stories of God's salvation and deliverance in the Bible, they all point us to one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. The prophet John called him the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he came down from heaven, born of a virgin, lived among sinful men, but he lived a perfect sinless life so that he could die on the cross, willingly laying down his life for us to pay the penalty for our sins. God loves you and me. And God gave his Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to take the punishment for our sins. He died as a substitute, a sacrificial lamb to redeem us, to buy us back out of our sinfulness, to love us even when we'd gone astray from God, and to restore us back into a relationship with him. God is not wanting us to just practice some religion. He wants a relationship with you and with me. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. This is bad news. If you and I got what we deserved for our sins, it would be be death and hell, separation from God forever. But can I tell you something? There's good news. There's wonderful news. The verse doesn't end there. Yes, it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God is holding out a gift to you today, just waiting for you to accept it. And that gift was purchased by the death and shed blood of the Son of God, the Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for your sins and mine. Those beautiful nail-scarred hands of Jesus are holding the gift of salvation out to you and asking you, will you believe on me? Will you trust me as your only hope for salvation? In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God is not looking for people going around doing good, people trying to just improve themselves and make themselves better so that they can earn God's favor or earn their way to heaven. God is looking for people to humbly admit their sinfulness and their unworthiness and to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. God loves sinners. and Jesus died for sinners. Why would Jesus die for sinners? Doesn't it sound rather morbid? Uh, For many people, death just means despair and sorrow, the end of everything. But Jesus gave his life for us, knowing that he had the power to take it up again. 
Yes, Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross for sinners, but three days later, up from the grave, he arose. And it's this Jesus who has power over death and power over the grave, who has power to forgive our sins, power to save our souls, power to give us eternal life, power to take us to heaven when we die. Death of the body is certainly not the end. When a person dies and their body is buried, their soul and spirit is separated from the body and will either go to heaven to be with God or will go to hell to await the final judgment of God one day. When I was just an eight-year-old boy, my father was killed in a farm accident. When I was 16 years old, my brother, just 22 years of age, just married, was killed in a car accident. But you know something? I know that I'm going to see them again in heaven one day. Why? Because they had trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We believe in the resurrection. The Bible speaks of a final resurrection. And this same Jesus, the one who rose up from the grave and is alive today, is one day coming again in the clouds. And the Bible says he's coming back again for his own, for those that belong to Jesus, for those that have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. About 2,000 years ago, Jesus ascended to heaven after his death and burial and resurrection. And for these 2,000 years, he's been preparing a place in heaven for all those who will believe on him and trust him alone as their Savior. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. You can't work your way to heaven by your good works. You can't earn your way to heaven by religious rituals and deeds. But you can decide to put your faith and trust completely in him as your personal savior. And that's your choice. If I could make that choice or decision for you, I would, but I can't make it. You for yourself must choose to believe. You must decide to trust in Jesus as the Son of God and the Savior of the world and as your personal Savior. It's a decision only you can make. The Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God doesn't want anyone to be boasting or proud in heaven. There'll be no sin in heaven. He doesn't want us boasting, well, I was a good person, or I was religious, or, or I was born a Christian. None of that matters. When God's judgment falls on this sinful world, you and I can only be saved if the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to the doorposts of our heart. Have you trusted him as your personal Savior? Why don't you lay down that heavy burden of sin, lay it down at the foot of the cross? And why don't you accept the gift of salvation that the beautiful hands of Jesus is holding out to you today? He held out those arms and allowed soldiers to nail him to that cross because he loved you. And he wants to save you from your sin. And he wants to bring you into a wonderful relationship with him. Not one of working to earn salvation, not one of practicing religion to somehow please God, but a relationship of wonderful peace in your heart, knowing that you are saved, knowing that you are already forgiven of your sins, knowing that you are accepted in Christ, and not because of anything that you could ever do, but because of what Jesus Christ has already done for you. Because your faith is completely in him. Jesus Christ died for our sins. For your sins and for my sins. He was buried and he rose again. Will you admit that you are a sinner? Will you accept the truth of God's word? That our sin condemns us. And makes us stand guilty and ashamed when we compare ourselves to a holy and perfect God and creator. Will you believe that Jesus Christ is God's son? Will you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose again? Will you believe and trust in Jesus alone to save your soul, to forgive your sins, and to take you to heaven? When you believe in the miracle of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, then another great miracle can take place, the salvation of your soul. 
It's a miracle that God saved me. But I know that Jesus loves sinners. He has saved me. He's forgiven me. He's my friend. He's my Savior. And He's my Redeemer. Please reach out to Jesus today with sincere faith in your heart and receive the gift of salvation that Jesus is holding out to you. The gift only becomes yours when you accept it. Don't let pride keep you from reaching out to Jesus, believing on Him and trusting Him as your Savior. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. He's generous in mercy and pardon. He'll save anyone that will believe and call on him. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, you ought to call out to God in prayer and call on him and ask him to save you from your sin and forgive you and take you to heaven. But it starts with a decision in the heart. It's got to be a heart decision. May I say that everyone's welcome at the cross. All are welcome. If you sincerely in your heart today are making that decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior, then I encourage you, right now, wherever you are, maybe in a living room, maybe in a bedroom, maybe in an office, the night when I believed on Jesus Christ as my Savior, I was kneeling by my bed, and from my heart in sincere faith, I cried out to God, in prayer and just ask Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Wherever you are right now, will you call out to God? A prayer of faith from your heart? Will you make that decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior? I encourage you to call out to God with a simple prayer from your heart asking Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and to change you and to take you to heaven. There's no special prayer. There's no special words that save a person. It's just got to be a sincere heart of faith that will cry out to God. And say, God, I believe in you. Jesus Christ, I believe that you're the Son of God. God, I know you're holy and perfect, but I know that I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins, that you were buried and that you rose again. And I'm trusting you, Jesus and you alone to save my soul, to forgive my sins, and to take me to heaven. Pray something like that, sincerely from your heart to God. But in your heart, you must believe. You must believe. We don't say a prayer to appease someone. We believe in our heart. That's where faith begins. As I finish this message to you, again, I urge you to make that decision to trust Jesus Christ alone as your Savior. Call me, text me, message me, email me. Let me know if I can help you to understand something better. Please also contact me. Let me know after watching this if you're making that decision today to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. As we close, you can listen to the words of a song that remind us that all of us are welcome at the cross. Jesus Christ will save anyone from any nation, from any religious background. If you will turn to Jesus Christ, believe in him as the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and trust him alone as your personal Savior. If you'd like a free copy of a little book called Done, What Most Religions Don't Tell You About the Bible, then I would gladly send it to you as a gift. You'll see on the following screen, uh, an email, a phone number, where you can contact us. Again, let me know if you've trusted Christ as your Savior today. Let me know if you have any questions. And let me know if you'd like a copy of this little book called Done. We have the book available in English that I could mail it to anyone in, in Ontario. 
I also have the book as a PDF that we could email it in English or Chinese or Spanish or Romanian. May God bless you today, and I pray that you've made a decision to believe in the resurrected Savior and to trust Him alone as your personal Savior. Have a great Easter Resurrection Sunday. God bless you. Jesus Christ.